Jesus said to his disciples, You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer, but if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, 
What more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Last night I spoke about how when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and that was an invitation to the crowd, to those in the crowd who wanted to follow him, to follow him up the mountain. And it was on the mountain that he taught them, meaning his disciples, those who came. And we talked a little bit about why they came, you know, the Beatitudes. He saw these very qualities in them because that was the very reason they set out in search, seeking the Lord, seeking God. Tonight we get into the, we might say, the meat of the uh, Sermon on the Mount. We might say these are the passages where the climbing gets more difficult because it is a call to love as Christ loves. And I, I want to begin this, uh, this talk by going back to the very opening words of uh, Jesus in Matthew's Gospel. His opening message is repent. Now, so often when we hear those words, especially associated with Lent, uh, we think of we have to come up with all our sins, and somehow we have to uh, turn away from those sins. And so there is this almost uh, a frenetic kind of um, activity trying to figure out, well, what are my sins? You know, and a scrupulous person is never quite done with it. Now, if I could only confess perfectly that somehow I have repented perfectly. In some ways, repentance has more to do with a change of heart than it is to just simply identify our sins. Repentance is to allow God to change our hearts from our agenda and our plans and our way of seeing things and the way we would like things to turn out and the way we think that the world should be run and how, you know, justice should be meted out to the way God sees things. So it's moving our hearts from a heart, you might say, and then it's very much closed, like a bit like that heart of stone, to a heart of flesh. That's what repentance is. It's a change of heart. And in this uh, part of the Gospel, and it's preceded by um, well, five other uh, passages like this where Jesus starts, you know, well, you've heard it said, but I say to you. The first part when he says, you've heard it said, that's where we are at. That's where our hearts really are at. If we're truly honest, that's kind of how the world operates. And we tend to operate very much according to the way the world has uh, taught us. And then we have Jesus saying, but I say to you, this is where he's moving us and moving our hearts to consider something different. That's why I wanted to start with repentance and the message of repentance. That's at the very outset of the gospel. 
because it is really a message of repentance. What was God's original purpose in giving us the law in walking with his people? How was it that Israel was to be a light to the nations? Where indeed did they go wrong? Where indeed did the prophets find fault and say, your ways are not my ways, O my people? So he starts out by where we are at. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This was actually, uh, it's called the Lex Talionis, and it was actually an improvement of how things were prior to the giving of that particular law. Prior to that, if someone killed one of your clansmen, you'd go out and kill two of theirs. That would show them, and now it teach them that I can always up the ante. The Lex Talionis is really fair retribution. One for one, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. So things don't go out of control. And it was a real advancement in so far as the law was concerned. We still operate by the Lex Talionis. You know, we have this saying, you know, uh, you commit a crime, you do the time. And the time better suit the crime, otherwise we cry foul. We say, wait a second, you know, you created me. This particular person uh, injured, caused such injury uh, that, you know, that sentence is way too light. And in other things, too, if we truly look at the way we look at justice from a human point of view, it's still very much an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Even in regards to responding with force. You know, in a case of war. You know, when someone comes at you, and then you get right back at them with, a, you know, a, a, with, with an equal force. You don't want to cause worse damage because then, in a sense, you are seen as the aggressor. But you are to indeed uh, stop the other person, but with an equal and measured force. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. And Jesus says, that's, that's not my teaching. It's not my teaching. But I say to you, and let's face it, up to now in Matthew's Gospel, in the, in the Sermon on the Mount, you know, when he speaks about, you know, uh, um, looking at a woman with lust, you know, he says, oh, yeah, 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 yeah that's fair, fair point, fair point, you, 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 you've got me there. Or, you know, uh, uh, when he says, you know, when you're angry with a brother, and, you know, you call him a fool, he says, yep, 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 I've got to reconcile, that's, that's fine. But when we get to this portion of the Sermon on the Mount, we're going, like, wait a sec, wait a sec, you're going way too far. Now listen to what he says. Do not resist an evildoer. That almost sounds foolish. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, offer the other one also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, Give your cloak as well. If, and if anyone forces you to go one mile, go two miles. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. And then he goes into the whole idea of loving your enemy. And pray for those who persecute you. And we go to ourselves and we say, look, look, God, this is impossible. This is impossible for us to live. And we come face to face with the fact that it is impossible without God's grace. That it is only possible 
as we embrace the very truth of his teaching. He came to show us what love is all about. He came to show us the love of the Father. And so we struggle with this passage. We struggle because it is the difficult part of the cry. It's where we meet the most resistance in us. I'd like to pick one of the examples. You know, it says here, if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with them also the second mile. Now, when I was younger, I thought, oh, okay, you have to go over and above what is being asked of you. In a sense, yeah, that's what the passage means, but there was a real situation that Jesus was addressing in this passage. You see, the Roman soldiers were able to conscript any citizen from any country where they were occupied. They were, to, they were allowed to conscript them to carry their baggage for one mile, but no further. In fact, they were ordered under pain of punishment not to go any further than one mile with the same person. Jesus says, if anyone asks you to go one mile, oh, well, they knew exactly what he was talking about. That's the Romans. We hate the Romans. We don't want to collaborate with them. Go two miles. You could just imagine what they were saying in their hearts. There is no way. And I'm sure there would have been expletives between the no and the way. sense, you know, uh, that now you put, you're putting yourself in a totally different position vis-a-vis -vis this Roman soldier. They're teaching them something. Saints, this is not about obligation. This is about love. This is about barriers that are being broken. This teaching is actually quite radical. And it is the only way to overcome sin and to overcome evil in this world. Love is more powerful than the force of evil, than the force of sin. And it is only once we adopt that love say, yeah, yeah, my heart has to change. You see, in the old way, or, or the way that we so usually, uh, you know, refer to sin, you know, you, you know, we might say, we might have to confess something as sinful as, for example, I gossiped, you know, I said some things about my neighbor that uh, were unfair or to put them in a bad light or whatever it may be. Maybe it's not, uh, you know, the gossip that is really at the root of things. Maybe we really haven't begun to truly love them. Oh, we might say we love them. I mean, I do the same thing. Oh yeah, oh, of course I love my neighbor. Do you? Look at how you talk about them. Is there a bit of envy? A sense of pride and self about your your better? Is there a judgment? What's what's
preventing the love? What's at the heart of the matter? What's stopping us? That's what I mean by our hearts needs changing. The way we are oriented towards them. Not just the, the, the gossip is just a symptom. It's kind of like when a doctor asks us, you know, uh, uh, what's wrong? Well, I have a pain. Well, what does it feel like? Well, what else is it leading to? Uh, and he'll ask us questions about uh, this or that. But often it comes down to a lack of love. My heart is not fully set on them. My heart is still very much set on myself. You know, we can dismiss this whole passage and indeed much of what Jesus says, except for one thing. He's the one who lives it. Listen to the passage again. And see how it relates to Christ. It reveals him perfectly in every single sentence. Here we go. Do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forced you to go one mile, go with them also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you, and do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies, and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. He did not resist an evildoer. In fact, he gave himself up into their hands, and they struck him. He offered the other cheek. When he took his coat, they took the rest of his garments and stripped them bare. He went the extra mile. He walked the way of the cross. carrying our load. He gave to everyone who begged from him, the many who came, the many who petitioned, and he didn't refuse anyone who wanted to borrow from him. He loved his enemy. He prayed for those who were persecuting him. We see in this passage the Son of God. And what is he telling us? Come follow me. It's an invitation for us to enter more deeply into his love, into his sacred heart, and there to find our consolation, our strength. Repent. Heart of stone and 
turned into a heart of flesh. Help me to love as you love. Because so often my love is a settling on mediocrity. And that's the last part of the passage. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? A lot of people are saying, you Christians, we don't see terribly much difference in you than in anyone else. You're almost struggling to fit in. If you love those who love you, isn't that just a commercial exchange? Quid pro quo, this or that. And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, Isn't just that custom habit? Be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. Set your heart and mind on the things of God. So as we spend some time before the Blessed Sacrament, we ask that the Lord teach us how to love as he gives himself fully on the cross as he does in this sacrament for he is one with the cross. May we behold his love and may we ask him transform us Lead us during these days of Holy Week to consider your cross and so to find new life. We'll have a few minutes of uh, quiet reflection before the sacrament and then I'll come back and uh, we'll close things off.
let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this opportunity to contemplate your love for us and for calling us deeper into your love, where so often we're simply looking for a makeover. You indeed uh, are uh, offering a change of heart. We ask that uh, indeed we may long for the gift, that we may continue our climb, however difficult it may be, and trust in your grace. as children to our Father in heaven. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And may Almighty God bless you and grant you a peaceful night. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we go in peace. Some move and live and move.